All right, folks, from the shores of the Great Slave Lake straight over to Nashville with my guest today, Mark Slutter, who has released his sophomore solo release halfway there via David Ellefson's EMP label group. Halfway there, like I said, the name of the album, Mark Slaughter, the guest. Mark, how are you doing, my friend? Doing great. How are you? Good, good, man. It's been uh, it's been a few years since we chatted. Unfortunately, we didn't, uh, you know, manage to connect up when you uh, put out the first solo release. So I'm really uh, glad and you know stoked and excited to have you on now. Oh yeah, me too. Me too. It's uh, you know it's one of those things you you release music, you put it out there, and it's you know continuously doing art. But you know it's kind of like uh, getting back in the saddle when you haven't made it for a while. So this has been. Uh, Really exciting uh, for for me to be a part of uh, uh, the EMP label group. We're we're reaching top twenty on uh, the first single, so it's That's exciting amazing. stuff for us. Well, now yeah. you've known David though for like thirty years, so this relationship with his label then shouldn't be surprising to too many people that know that. But I'm not sure how many people do know that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what it is is, you know, we've, we've all been doing this for a long time, and you find people in this industry that you are, are, are like-minded and, and have the same integrity as you do, and uh, Dave's certainly one of those people, and uh, it's nice to be a part of it. We've, uh, so far, we released this record last Friday, yeah. so it's been a week out, and, uh, you know, we're getting some great reviews, and we're moving some product, and, you know, more importantly... Uh, uh, people are really emotionally uh, getting moved by the music, so it, it's exciting for me. Yeah, now I know a lot of people have been saying this is sort of, uh, you know, return to that almost like Slaughter-esque heavy format, you know, but, I mean, there's a reason for that as well, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, you know, Dana and I produced those records way back when. It was, you know, we were the producers on it and yeah. continued to, to do that, and I think that's you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, you know, if you're a writer, producer, and and did it from the very beginning, I think that you 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 have your chops and you know how to do it, and and certainly that's what uh, uh, people will hear on this record. I think that you know, recording wise, I think I I really hit the mark on it, and and uh, I'm just really incredibly excited about this. Yeah. Now, you, I I think you know the the quote is you were trying to make sort of a more of a long play record almost you know old school like you know as if a kid were listening to it on the headphones kind of like that old vinyl yeah. slash cassette format it, it, it was made for vinyl that was one of the things that i was like well it's too long and this is too long and if we put these songs in it was really you know there were songs that were put on the side because they didn't fit on the body of a of a long play record and that was ultimately what we pushed foremost on on this uh i really wanted it to have that that classic rock sensibility to it instead of just throwing out a record i mean you know a lot of bands are out there just doing making records but they're just throwing their demos out there they're not putting the heart they're not putting their soul in it and and again you know they they you know the budgets are less so they can't they really don't know how to do it but uh you know luckily i've you know, Slaughter is one of the bands, I, I think we're the only band from our genre that wrote, produced, and still perform that music to this day. So, yeah. um, you know, we're still out there doing it. Speaking of Slaughter, though, I mean, you guys were a band that originated sort of out of that Vegas area, but, you know, you at some point moved over to Nashville. I mean, how many years have you been out in Nashville, just for the sake of people that, you know, don't have those facts in front of them? Um, I, I've been in Nashville for about 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I just found that Vegas was, was kind of like a screen door to Los Angeles more than it was Vegas that I grew up. Even I grew up in Vegas, it was green acres of lights. It was a totally different mindset. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I really, I actually do enjoy the serenity of walking out and seeing stars at night. And certainly with the light pollution out there in Vegas, I was losing all the things that I love. So, you know, we're out here with uh, on on acreage with lots of trees and looking at stars and kind of keeping things in perspective of of, uh, of where things really are in life as opposed to, you know, the a, a copy version of of France. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> good one, good this is your one. Eiffel Tower. This is your Eiffel Tower. It's a little, it's only a quarter scale to the real Eiffel Tower, but That's this true. is what it looks like. You, you know, you got Paris on the brain after all the politicking going on the last couple of days. Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, it is it the stupidity and politics and everything else is just like you know, man, it's just crazy. Yeah. Now I was going to mention, you know, the the fact that you've been in Music City for. 20 years i mean you know i i would imagine your your songwriting has has evolved over time correct like you know in terms of the direction I, and everything it really has music city is this is probably the most prolific songwriters in the world uh, live here mm-hmm. and uh i've had a chance to write with several of them uh I wrote with a couple on this record i wrote half the record myself and half of it with other people but I think that ultimately what I was, you know, I was trying to say something as opposed to just, you know, fun in the sky and let's go fly a kite and insect bite or whatever. You know, it's just like trying to do something that really has something that, that people can walk away with. Wow, that's really intense. That's, you know, I, 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 I get it. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, music, real good music always strikes that hard chord. And that's really what I tried to do with this record. Yeah, yeah, that's true, and I mean, I know that there's an old uh, drumming acquaintance too that's uh, sort of uh, you know come back to to work with you. I, I think uh, J- Josh Egan, uh, uh, old high school buddy, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy. His dad was a, you know again in Vegas. It was a different thing. His dad was uh, the musical director for Sammy Davis Jr. So, uh, and we went we went to high school. We went to high school together, and he was a really talented guy, and he uh, continued to work with bands such as Toto and, and, and that, and he uh, works in the studio in uh, Los Angeles now. And, uh, um, you know, it was nice to re- reconnect with uh, good friends and to continue uh, making the music out there. Now, in terms of you working with uh, Josh, though, I think you guys were, you know, sending uh you know material back and forth right i mean you weren't sitting together in the studio so i mean you know what what were some of the challenges there um it, you know really it's it's not challenges it's i you know i would program drum to kind of what i was hearing and then he would just go okay i get it and he would go ahead and put things towards that and uh you know it, it was he understood where i was coming from because we kind of grew up in the same area and knew the same music yeah so that's that's kind of how it was yeah i i think i read something somewhere just basically saying that maybe you're you know not i i don't know if this is quite the right wording but i mean maybe you're not going to be so picky about josh's choices like that you you know have trust and faith in him as a fellow musician to sort of you know do what best suits the song well yeah and, and he knows what's best for the song as well as you know if if there's something i heard if i said you know i want some backbeats on two and four he'd say okay no problem he'd go in the studio and about 10 minutes later i'd have my backbeats on two and four i mean it, it's just you know you learn to speak the same language as, as other artists in that side yeah for sure now another thing that i noticed about this record is that you know there, there's some pretty pretty heavy tracks just you know musically like the track conspiracy for instance almost sounds like it's got a bit of a uh, alice in chains vibe to it yeah it you know it it when you add the vocal uh the minor third to it it sounds more like that and if you take the minor third it sounds more like seven so it's kind of like that's just kind of where it went yeah you know not and not intentionally it's just kind of where you know, music evolves. Again, that's how music evolves from from one, you know, one uh, genre to another. You know, somebody's taking the roots of something else and they just kind of make it their own. So I can hear what you're talking about on this, and it wasn't a conscious decision to do that. It was just kind of what the song asked for. Yeah, now, I, I know you've been quoted as saying that you're you're taking a few more liberties though on on the solo side that you maybe wouldn't do when you're with a group assuming that you're talking about slaughter so i mean you know is is that a song that you would consider yourself maybe taking some of those solo liberties yeah i would say i would say that's one of them because it's also not you know it's a little darker 
In mm-hmm. fact, you know, one of the comments that Dana said is, this is really dark. I don't know if that's really you, but, uh, I, you know, it, it, in Slaughter, there were songs that also had that as well. So I don't necessarily agree with that that view, but that's why I did it on my own thing, because yeah. that is what I think it should be. Yeah, I, I guess I'm curious to know, like, what you're considering yourself as an artist taking the liberties on your record would be specifically. Um, I think that there's more in a recording side of things that, you know, there's there's certain ways that I would do it and certain ways that other people would, would record. I mean, when it's two people in a room, the two people have to agree to go forward. When it's one person in the room, you just go, I believe this is the best thing to do. I'll just do whatever I think. Mm-hmm. So you, you, there's a different type of freedom and, and non-conforming than when you're doing it by yourself as opposed to other artists. And I don't necessarily think that think that one is better than the other. It's just that it is different mm-hmm. in that side, and it is a different mindset. And I did want to tell a little bit different story uh, uh, emotionally on this record, you know, uh, than I would on the Slaughter record because it's more personal than it is, you know, here's a band and we're going to come kick kick ass and <laughs> be the ambassador of the party. And, you know, it's just, it is a different mindset. It's a little bit more personal. Yeah. Now, I, I was just going to say, uh, maybe though some of that personal, uh, you know, um, feel that you're putting into the record, though, maybe has to do with the fact that in 2015, you managed to get a hold of, of Tim Kelly's Purple Robin guitar. I mean, you know, like right. I, I would imagine that would be extremely emotional for you. Yeah, it, and it really was. And, and you know, those type of things are when things circle back to you that way, it's like that meant to be thing. And and certainly, you, you know, it becomes a part of, uh, of your history and part of not only, you know, uh, uh, my legacy, but Tim's legacy, and it just kind of carries on. So it's kind of uh, those those things are, are special moments when they happen. Mm-hmm. And it's not happening by happenstance. It just it's happening for the right reasons. You know? How did the guitar come into your possession specifically? Um, there's a gentleman who contacted me through uh, my Facebook page. His name's Rodney Hardison. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, I ha- I believe I have Tim Kelly's uh, purple grape guitar. And I said, wow. I said, well, we'll be playing here if you'd like to come to the show. And he said, I'd love to. So he came to the show. He met me before we played and uh, brought the guitar. And, uh, you know, basically he, uh, you know, he said, I-, I-, I think it needs to come home. Mm-hmm. And uh, in that, he basically handed me the, the guitar. And, and you know, it's funny because we both argued over the color purple when we when he first joined the band. <laughs> and lo and behold, the purple guitar is the one that, that, you know, of all the collection of guitars, that was the one that has the most meaning, mm-hmm. you know, to me. So it, it's, you know, again, it's, it's uh, pretty crazy how things happen that way. But uh, I'm sure glad to have it on board and all over the record. What was the first thing that popped into your mind when you saw it for the first time in, you know, 20 odd years? Mm, it's an old friend, you know, yeah. it's an old friend. You see that and you kind of go, you know, it's an old friend and all the things associated with that old friend. And that's, uh, you know, obviously Tim. And, you know, we, we opened the tour with Poison and he played that guitar and he played it with, on the Kiss tour. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, you know, it was a big, big part of uh, Slaughter history in that. And, you know, certainly one of the songs, first songs that was used on was Supernatural, which is, you know, kind of what I was, you know, hearing and seeing and thinking when I was, you know, writing this record. Yeah. So, I, I you know, I think it is, it, you know, also sparked the, another, you know, the solo on that. You know, it's it's just crazy how it works. Yeah, I mean, I I I would wouldn't go far as to say you were you know channeling Tim in the track, but I mean at the same time, like you were you were trying to respect Tim, his legacy, and of course you know Tim's guitar as well on on the track and other tracks on halfway there that you uh, that you use the guitar on, correct? Yeah, and it, and it is it, it, again, it's it's just it, it's like an old friend. It's just that whole comfort of just going, of knowing this, you know, it, 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 I think that's it with life and, and people and legacies and, 
you know, we, we, we have our loved ones, we lo- lose our loved ones and, and, uh, um, you know, it's just a constant reminder. Mm-hmm. And it just, it, if you if you want to call it channeling, yeah, it is kind of channeling in its way. You know, I think the music ultimately is channeling and it is keeping yourself open and not having any fear. Ultimately, there is a, there is a, uh, you know, speaking of you teaching music, there was a, a teacher or, or that I had when I was in uh, junior high school. It was actually in ninth grade. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I lived in Vegas. So there was all these jazz cats that came in. And this one uh, trumpet player came in who played with Glenn Miller. And he came and sat down with every person in the band, the jazz band that I was in. And he sat there when I was reading the chart down. And he said probably the best advice I've ever had in music, which is, number one, somebody always has the bouncing ball, which is the melody. And somebody will always have that melody, and you got to give them a chance to back off so that they can have that bouncing ball. And the other side of it is is, is that, uh, um, you know, that if not to have fear and take those moments. If you do make a mistake, if you meant to make that, play that note it's not a mistake and that's the beautiful part of jazz which has also found its way into rock and roll which is you take the fear out and make it completely creative then it becomes something above and beyond what who you are but it, it becomes an open channel and it becomes something that's just a, you know this constant uh of flow so to speak instead of something that's mindful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i was just thinking now you know, next year is the, I guess, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, the 30th anniversary of the in, the inception of of Slaughter. Right. Which, you know, I, I mean, that that that's an, an incredible legacy that, that you guys have, have left behind, if you don't mind me saying. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because, you know, we've been living it the whole time, so I, I really need it. You don't give it that much thought, but it certainly is that. It is, it's, uh, um, you know, we've continued to tour. We've been a part of some some great stages with some legendary acts. Mm-hmm. And, uh, again, I think you, you spend more time just doing it instead of thinking about it. But, you know, looking back on it, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's certainly certainly is amazing. It certainly is a blessing to be able to do that. Yeah, for sure. Now, in 1988, and I mean, I know inevitably this always comes up in interviews with yourself, and I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily go in that direction. But I mean, one, one thing I do want to say, though, is that, you know, you guys left Vinny and, you know, thinking about all of the things that you just said about melody and conscious choices, I think that was part of a frustration that you had being in the invasion correct that you necessarily couldn't explore maybe the more melodic side of of Vinny's writing that it was so guitar driven and you know the flight of the bumblebee style solos that were like on every track and well and again his his songs were amazing but then the bumblebee would step in and I think it wasn't about that I I think that it's the same thing with on this record for me you Mm -hmm. know the solo on hey you for instance I can play a lot more intricate solo than I did on that, but it needed more of a slow hand to it than it needed something to say, look what I can do, look what I can do, look what I can do. You know, you have to play to what the song asked for. Mm-hmm. And that ultimately as a musician, it's it's not always like, you know, like putting yourself out there mm-hmm. is like, oh my gosh, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's what the song asked for. As yeah. a musician is being part of the song to make the song uh, believable, number one, and also emotional for the listener. Yeah. Was was Tim Kelly that guy then that could do that for you in Slaughter? Like, did you guys make that, you and Dana, make that conscious choice back in 88? Um, well, when, when Tim, well, when we started Slaughter, it was, it was how do we make songs that become a part of people's lives? Mm-hmm. That was ultimately what is popular. What is it that we like? What are the beats permitted of what people like? And it is, you know, I wouldn't say it's overthought, 
but I would say that there was thought and it was a conscious effort to to write songs that, that would live on instead of like, hey, let's just write some songs. We're in the band. It's cool. <laughs> it, it was it was like, okay, what is it that represents what is this song? Does this song belong in this record? And you're, and you know, and that conscious decision was more, you know, left to Dana and myself. And what don't we have? And then we would write the song to what we felt that wasn't a part of that record. Um, you know, I think the slaughter records usually had, we always tried to make it to where there was a, a little bit of sarcasm. There was a, there was fun. There was, you know, melancholy, there's sadness, there's happiness. And every aspect you try to make it to where every emotion is in that record so it has a balance to mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you have that balance, then somebody's going to find something within that record to go, that is exactly how I feel. You know, if there's just one song that, that, that somebody takes as their song or that means what they're going through, then you've as a songwriter, you reach those people, and as an artist, you've, you know, you've time stamped it. Yeah, definitely. Well, well, now getting back to halfway there, you refurbished that Tim Kelly purple guitar, and as we've talked about a little bit, um, you know, you used it on the record, and I, I know there's a there's a very wonderful video of uh, yourself and. Adam of uh, Fu Tone, uh, Reaver. you know, yeah, Adam Reaver, yeah, Adam Reaver, uh, just you know, working through the guitar and and maybe getting it to the specs that that uh, you know, as you put in the video, that Tim would have wanted it to go, which I, I thought was awesome. Well, it's it's technology has has come into a new, you know, it, with technology, you add twenty years onto something and. You know, it certainly becomes a lot better. You mm-hmm. know, there are things that you can do that can that can add to um, you know your end result, mm-hmm. and that that truly is what what I was doing with it is to say this is what you would have wanted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and again, I know. I again, it was one of those things that, that in that side of it, we you know, it's something that we would talk about consistently. Yeah. You know, so we're always like, you know, as gearheads, we're always like, you know, that makes the instrument better. No, I think this. And a maple neck does that. I mean, it was a it was a thing that we always were, you know, look, as a musician, you're always looking for the best sound that you can have. And it, each individual instrument has its own life. It has its own sound. It has its own vibe or 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 way of telling a story. Just regardless of who who plays it, it's got a certain tonality to it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with that guitar, I think that's really what it was, is, you know, the guitar company now is defunct. It's, it's broken up. It's gone. Yeah. So you can't even, they don't even make them anymore. And second of all, those are the pickups. Those are the things that Tim specialized that he liked. And, you know, all I did was upgrade the hardware on it and, uh, um, you know, it's just crazy. It really is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was just thinking now, like, is this guitar sort of going to be the, you know, permanent fixture in, in, you know, amongst the probably collection of guitars that you regularly use, Mark? Well, I I, I don't take that one out on the road much because it's kind of, because its value is not... Uh, the emotional value is priceless to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I have taken it out to a few key shows. We played Alpine, or I'm sorry, uh, um, we played over in Irvine Meadows at the at the amphitheater that, that's out there, and uh, that was one of the places, one of the biggest shows we played with him. Mm-hmm. And um, it was the first time we played in Los Angeles once we hit. We were playing there with with poison, and it was, you know, it was the height of all of our, you know, heyday, so to speak. And there was a lot of memories there, and that guitar was played at that show. So I felt it was kind of that full circle, bringing the guitar back for that show. Mm-hmm. So there's certain times, and I feel like I would bring it forward because 
I think that's what it's like taking Tim with me, so to speak, you know. Is there ever, you know, a chance that maybe the guitar might be able to be admired in a place like the Hard Rock in Vegas or have, you know, have places like that that know the guitar has sort of been repatriated that have contacted you for that reason? Yeah, I I that I haven't talked to the Hard Rock. They've got one of Tim's guitars now. They've got one of my guitars. They've you know they've got stuff in their collection right now. But you know I don't know if I would release this to the Hard Rock because I've already one of the the only uh, theft that the Hard Rock has actually had is one of my guitars. Mm-hmm. So you know keeping that in mind, I you know I don't know I I, I don't want to see that lost or to go into, you know, some dark closet someplace. I really want it to be seen. So yeah. I'd want to make sure it was front and front and center at, you know, Smithsonian or someplace that would really go there or, you know, a place that would live in my kid's house, you know, later on in life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's certainly a, a fitting tribute and, and a beautiful story. And it, it just, makes you know the release of of halfway there uh that much more special so i mean i'm I'm really glad that you you've shared the story of the of the guitar and and also that we've gotten the chance to uh to talk about this awesome record that you've released well thank you you know i'm really 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 pleased with the end result of music and as as a teacher i'm sure you're very well aware it's it becomes more the choices of 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 uh sometimes it's the spaces in between that are as important as the notes yeah that are on paper and uh certainly in that side of it i think this record breathes a lot i think there's a lot of life in this record and i think that you know people will certainly um you know if if you listen to the record and get a speeding ticket to it <laughs> you can you can cry to it you can smile to it and i think that's you know again any record that I've ever loved had that type of, of, uh, uh, diversity. And I certainly in this record and I'm real proud of it. All right, man. Well, uh, thanks very much for uh, taking the time out to chat with, uh, halfway there. Uh, like I said, off the top released May 26th on, uh, you know, David Ellison's EMP, uh, label group and uh, it's it's really exciting to uh, to hear some new music from you Mark and I like I said I appreciate uh, your time on Do You Know Jack today well I appreciate it and uh, certainly if there's uh, anything down the way of, that we're going to be in your area reach out I'd love for you to come to the show and uh, we'll take care of you right on Mark I, I definitely appreciate that thanks <laughs>